Hello, big team. Hello, friends. Welcome to Lizzie Fay Loves Books. I'm Elizabeth. And in this video, I would like to compare and discuss some Civil War fiction that I have read, most of which I have loved. Some of it is very new. Some of it is very old. And none of it I own. All of these are library books. I started out just wanting to talk about one or two of the most recent books that I've read. And then as I was reading some reviews and people were comparing one of these in particular with one of the older books, I thought, well, that would be kind of a fun video just to compare characters from those two books. And then I thought, why not just do a whole video about Civil War fiction? So I have really, really enjoyed all of these books that I have read, except one. And I even went ahead and checked out the one that I didn't love just to give the full spectrum of what I've read. I also will mention a couple of middle grade books that I neglected to check out from the library and I don't own, but they're both Newbery winners. So um, I'll tell you how you can hear more about those in a little while. But let's just get started. So let me tell you about each of the books. I'm going to try really hard not to give any spoilers, at least not anything that's going to matter. If you've read these books, then I'd be interested to know if you have had any similar thoughts as me or if you've had completely different thoughts or how you felt. If you haven't read these books and you are interested in reading them, I don't think that anything I'm going to say would give you any spoilers that will adversely affect your reading. Hopefully they will just give you enough information that you would want to go and read the books and form your own opinions. And I, I, like I said, I'm going to try really hard not to say anything that I think would ruin the book for you by any means, because I just certainly don't want to do that. So um, let's just start with, I guess, newest to oldest. And I'll just tell you a little bit about uh, the books most of which you have probably already read. And whether you've really thought about them in in this context, I don't know. But let's just let's just talk about them. So the most recent one is a new release this year. It is um by Martha Hall Kelly. It's third in her Lost Roses or uh, Lilac Girls series, but you don't need to read one to read the other. In fact, I didn't love the other two nearly as much as I loved this one. And this one can certainly stand alone completely fine without reading the others. It is connected by the fact that one of one or two of the characters here are ancestors of the people in the other two books, but you don't need to know all of that to read this book. So this has, <laughs> you know, it, I, it's got three main perspectives. I thought four, but then I could never figure out where the fourth one came in, and I'm still not sure. But there are four different narrators on the audiobook, and I think that fourth narrator came in near the end where there was a letter read by the sister of the main, one of the main characters. And so I apologize if you've been following me talking about this book back when I read it, I, I was a little confused myself. There are three main perspectives. One is a northern girl who is an abolitionist. I should say young woman. Uh, probably in her late 20s, early 30s. Um, maybe somewhere around there. Single. And then there is a, a young woman. Probably, is she still a teenager? Who is in slavery. And then there is a, a woman probably also in her 20s, who is the mistress of a plantation and is a slave owner. So those are the three perspectives in this. Later on, I want to come back and do a little bit of a comparison of the the mistress of the plantation. Her name is Anne May Wilson Watson. She inherited this plantation from her aunt, who was also the mistress of the plantation, and had left instructions in her will for her slaves to be freed at the time of her death. Well, Anne May took over the plantation and did nothing of the sort. Tore up, you know, pretty much just took anything that her aunt wanted her to do, threw that out the window, and did what she wanted to do. I want to compare her character with the character of Scarlett O'Hara in Gone with the Wind. Um, there are a few parallels and um and I have seen other reviews where um 
there they were talked about the differences and I don't want to get into too much of it here but stick with me because um I just want to chat a little bit about both of the characters and why uh what I think about them and how they compare and contrast. So I thought this book was fantastic. I really really loved it. Uh not everybody not everybody does and I think Part of the reason uh, the, a couple of reviews I read is because they were comparing Anne May to Scarlett O'Hara, and I think she is her own character. I don't really agree with comparing them to the to the extent that you would love one and not the other, because they're just very different. So. I don't want to get into too much until I get through all the books. But anyway, so this is The Sunflower Sisters by Martha Hall Kelly. And it just came out this year. Now, we are reading that for my book club, uh, my library book club, later in the year. But I went ahead and just had my name on the prepub list for it and was able to get an audio copy not long after it came out. So I thought, you know, since this is a new book, it's probably going to be well sought after. I better just listen to it now while I have a chance. And so that's why I went ahead and listened to it early. And uh, I'm so glad that I did. It was, I just thought it was fantastic. So then another book club book we are uh, reading this year, or we have already read this, and this was published in 2020, is by Lisa Wingate. This is The Book of Lost Friends. This has a dual timeline. One is in the Reconstruction era, just post-Civil War, and it is about uh, one particular family, one particular girl, who is looking for her family that she was split from as they were sold. And so now that slavery is over, there I understand that this actually was a thing that happened. There was a a Christian newspaper who published letters from former slaves and pastors were encouraged to read this out loud wherever they were and it would help people reconnect with their families. So that is what this is based on. I believe the character in here is a fictitious character, but it's based, she is based on actual findings and actual historical figures that um, that utilized this. And I believe there are some actual articles in here from, uh, I mean, I, there are articles in here, but I believe they are actual articles that were, were actually published back in that time. So then there's a second timeline here, or a second uh, storyline, and it is set in the 1970s or 80s. I think 80s and it's about a teacher and she is living in the same area I believe it's Louisiana it's terrible that I don't remember it wasn't that long ago that I read this um, anyway it is connected because the um, one of the families who had been slave owners back in the slavery times their descendants still live in this area and this teacher is teaching in the school there and she is just helping these kids to connect with their roots and i i loved that storyline just as much as the historical storyline if not more my parents were both teachers my uh, brother and sister we've we all been educators of some fashion and uh, I'm, a, I'm a substitute teacher and my uh, my degree was in uh was in a, a a particular segment of um, of education, so I really, really enjoyed the education aspect and the teacher dealing with the students and the pushback from the community when she tried to do anything that was different than the the set curriculum. So I just thought this was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. I would highly recommend it. Lisa Wingate writes a lot of different types of books, and my sister has been reading quite a few books by her. I've read several by her, and uh, I hope that at some point in in the future, my sister and I will do a collab video about Lisa Wingate and her body of work. We'll probably each read a few more and then we will um, go back and just do a whole video about Lisa Wingate. Meanwhile, I definitely recommend picking this up. I thought it was fantastic. And then going back a little further, 
I have a book that is in a series, but you don't have to read the earlier books in the series to read this book. I neglected to look up what number this is, but this is in the Elm Creek Quilt series by Jennifer Shiverini. I've read the whole series, and I can honestly tell you, you do not have to read the rest of the series to read this book. This is called The Runaway Quilt, and I wish I could tell you what number it is. I'll type it in the description below. Uh, the Elm Creek Quilt series has various timelines. The different books are set in different uh, times. Quite a few of them are contemporary, and that is that story kind of should be told from the beginning, you know, the contemporary story. But then there are several that are historical. There's one called the Union Quilters that uh, is also set in and around the Civil War time. But this is the one I really want to talk about. This is called The Runaway Quilt, and this is centered around a young woman who has escaped from slavery. And this book centers around the idea that quilts could have been used to um, to help identify the pathway of the Underground Railroad. I don't believe it has ever been proven that they were, but it's definitely plausible. I love to think about it. Uh, the idea that it could have been, I just think is fantastic. And I, I just really, really enjoyed this book. And if you have, uh, if you ever pick this up and you don't want to pick up the rest of the series, that is totally fine. But if you read this one and you really enjoy it, the story of Joanna, who is the main, uh, the girl who has escaped from slavery in this story, her story is continued in this book, The Lost Quilter by Jennifer Shiverini, which is farther on down in the Elm Creek Quilt series. So these two could be read without reading the other the other books. And if you want to read further, the Union Quilters also could be read without having to read the other contemporary novels. I, I'm sorry, I just didn't think to check it out at the same time. But uh, anyway, this is enough to at least let you know about the series. I have read this entire series and uh, have loved almost all of them. There was one right near the end that I did not love, but still, it's a, a series I highly recommend. You don't even really have to, well, you don't have to be a quilter, because I'm not, um, and I wouldn't even say that you have to really love quilting. It's just a great story about relationships, and quilts are woven in, and um, just very, very good, and so I would recommend uh, both of these books, but especially The Runaway Quilter. I think, as, as I recall, um, I would go so far as to say this was my favorite of the whole Elm Creek Quilt series, and there are 21 or 22 books in that series. So then, um, I meant I, I actually did not go in the proper order because I have one here that was set uh, that was published in 2016. These were published in I think 2002 and 2009, as I recall. Um, I I did look in the front before I started the camera. I'm not going to look again because I don't have my glasses on, but somewhere around that time. This was published in 2016. We read this for book club, and this is the one in this whole video that I did not love. Now I mentioned that in. In this book, they talk about how quilts could have been used, but they weren't. In this book, <laughs> this is a reimagining of what if the Underground Railroad were a real railroad underground, uh, but it's not. It, it wasn't. We know that it wasn't. At least I hope we know that it wasn't. But this is written in such a way that it sounds so plausible that part of the reason I don't like this is because... There's just a little niggling concern in the back of my mind that somebody somewhere will get a hold of this book and say, oh, I didn't know it was a real railroad. Oh, that's cool. It was a real railroad. And they'll just go with that in mind and not realize that it, in fact, was not a real railroad. I'm going to take a phone call. I will be right back. Okay, I'm back. So that phone call took a few minutes and my camera shut off. So I thought, well, I will just go back to the last couple minutes of what I filmed just to remember where I was. And I realized I misspoke just a little bit. When I was talking about this book, The Lost Quilter by Jennifer Cheverini, I said that this is about the idea that they could have used quilts in the Underground Railroad, but they didn't. I shouldn't have said didn't because we don't know. It's very plausible and very possible that they did. It just has not ever been confirmed historically that quilts were in fact used in the Underground Railroad. So maybe they did, maybe they didn't, um, but you know, who knows. So now getting back to this though, <laughs> um, 
we know that there was no actual underground railroad. That was just a, a an illustration or a metaphor for the um, the system that was used to help slaves to uh, to freedom, and so. This book, though, the reason I didn't like it, I've pretty much already said, is because, well, part of the reason was because I, I'm i just too literal-minded. I don't, uh, and it's not that I don't like, you know, fantasy books. I do. I like for the, I like for books to be obviously fantasy or obviously real. And this was just a little too realistic, but yet there was no actual railroad. So, I don't know. I'm, I'm, Probably doesn't make any sense why I don't like it. The other thing, too, is that it was a little more gritty than is to my taste. Now, I will certainly acknowledge that slavery was very gritty, and I don't think we should sugarcoat it. And I think that is why um, a couple of the other books that have been written about that time period are uh, have been criticized, because they were not as realistic. You know, they basically sugarcoated it to an, to an extent. So, uh, this one definitely not sugarcoated in any way, shape or form. And, um, but just not to my taste. I just didn't love the book. Um, it's a very popular book and I'm not trying to tell you not to read it because if you enjoy civil war fiction, then you should definitely read it and form your own opinion for sure. Uh, I'm just letting you know that it wasn't my favorite. And this is by Colson Whitehead. It's just called the underground railroad. So, um, let's go on back then and go a little farther back in history. Now, this one arguably is nonfiction. <laughs> um, in fact, in the library, this was cataloged with nonfiction. But you can also argue that it's very fictionalized because the conversations and things that are here, there's no way anyone would have known what those conversations would be. So a certain amount of it has to be fictionalized. But this is Roots by Alex Haley. This book is based on his research into his own family's genealogy. And it starts back in, uh, I'm not even really sure when Kunta Kinte was captured in Africa and brought to the U.S. Um, it probably tells in here, but it's been several years since I have read this or listened to it on audio. But anyway, I loved this book. As I said, it starts with Kunta Kinte as an African man, young man who was captured. It follows his life all the way into the United States. And then it goes through at least a couple more generations of his family, uh, the, the meat of the story. And then near the end, it does connect um, the ancestral line all the way up to our author, Alex Haley. And I don't think it would be a spoiler for me to just tell you that it talks about in the end how he has, you know, as a part of his research, he was able to go to Africa and meet his relatives that, um, that are still in Africa. And I just think that is just phenomenal. I thought this book was so eye opening and, and beautiful and harsh and heartbreaking. And I just loved it. I remember watching the miniseries as a kid uh, from the 1970s. It starred LeVar Burton and many other amazing stars. And I just, uh, I highly recommend it. I have not seen the miniseries in many, many years, and I would like to try to find a copy somewhere. I don't even know if our library has it, but, um, anyway, I would love to watch it again and I would highly recommend this book. It is a doorstop, but, um, the audio is very good and, um, I would just, I would highly recommend it. And then going even farther back, I'm, I'm sure you can guess what I'm going to show next. Gone with the Wind by Margaret Mitchell. This is one of my mom's favorite books. I remember her reading this multiple times. It seems like every time she had a few minutes to sit down, she was either reading this book or something to do with The Sound of Music, something that had to do with Maria Von Trapp. And uh, so I... I I don't even have my own copy of this book. I think my uh, my mom's copy went to my sister because at the time she had not ever read it. I have read it. I've listened to it a couple of times, and uh, I love the book. Now, where I wanted to get into a comparison is a comparison of Scarlett O'Hara and Anne May Wilson Watson. So in Gone with the Wind, our main character, Scarlett O'Hara, does... Um, well, she she starts out just being the daughter of the plantation owner and eventually 
she becomes the person who's in charge throughout the war. I would say that the war itself plays a bigger part in this book than slavery because it has been said that the way the slaves are portrayed in this book are portrayed to be very loyal to the family, not ones to to run away. Um, the harshness, the cruelty of slavery is not as big of a factor in this book as the cruelty of war. And one thing about the character of Scarlett O'Hara is that through the book, she does experience growth. And even though so much of what she does is... Um, it's ridiculous. She's still one of my most favorite literary characters. She's got so many, so many levels. And do I like and approve of most of the things that she does? No, but she is not, one of the things that she is not really, I didn't gather, is she's not cruel to people. She's not cruel to her slaves. Where in this book, Anne Mae Wilson Watson is just a cruel individual who does not really grow in character throughout the book. So I think the comparisons of these two women who are mistresses of a plantation is about where the comparison stops. And I read a review, and I don't even remember who it was now, that said, uh, and they're certainly entitled to their opinion, Please understand, I'm not criticizing anyone's review. Uh, they said they didn't really like this because they felt like the, that the author was trying to make Anne May like Scarlett O'Hara and it just fell flat. I don't agree with that. I think she was trying to make Anne May her own person, really not even comparing the two because Anne May is a despicable human being. She is one of the main characters of this book, but she is most definitely an antagonist who continues to be an antagonist throughout the book. Um, with And really, I don't want to give spoilers. Um, let me, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. So she is... Um, so I think that the author wrote her so well that even though you can't stand her, you love to hate her kind of a thing. And you just, the book is so compelling because you just want to see what in the world horrible thing she is going to say or do next. She's so self-centered and self-righteous and, and completely oblivious to anyone else's pain around her. She is completely self-centered. And the way she's written, you just want to hit her, you know? But I think that's what makes it such a good book. And I think the character of Anne May is certainly more interesting than the abolitionist characters. Now, they were very interesting, too. But because they were, quote, good people... Their story, I guess, is not as, I hate to use the word, exciting, because they did do a lot, and they, their storyline is very good, very compelling. But as I was listening to it, every time we would come back to Anne May, I was like, okay, what, what is she going to do now, you know? And um, the, other, uh, the other character, who is a, a young slave girl, her part, um, her perspective is also... Very, very good. Very well written and very compelling. I'm trying to think of what the names are even. Um, we have Mary and Eliza Woolsey are the... Or not Eliza, Georgie. Georgina. I feel like Eliza is one of their names, though. But Georgie is what she goes by. Georgie is the one that we, we um, meet the most and we learn the most about. She's a very strong female character. Wants to be a nurse. She has been engaged to a doctor, but this doctor wants her to, he just wants her as a wife. He doesn't want her as a companion and as a medical partner. And she is very smart and very well educated in medical procedures. And her potential fiance just 
kind of like, well, you know, that's nice and all, but don't you want to just do what, you know, females do and get married and have babies? You know, that kind of a thing, which is so frustrating. Um, Gemma is the slave girl name of the character, and she is so strong, so amazing. There are some, a bit of the storyline that I think is a little unrealistic, but, you know, it's, it's, it's everyone's opinion, uh, you know, and not every book has it. You know, you rarely find a book where everything is perfect. Um, but I just thought this was a very good book, and I would encourage you to read it if you haven't already. And if you have read it, let's chat in the comments. Um, so as far as comparing this with Gone with the Wind, two different books. This one definitely more harsh. This is more about the the horrors of slavery. This is more about the horrors of war. And the two characters, while they are mistresses of a plantation, Scarlet is much more likable, even though she does some some goofy things and some horrible things, um, and, and definitely things that I don't agree with. She does grow throughout the book. Anne Mae Wilson Watson, very selfish, self-centered, um, you know, really not not redeemable, but super interesting to read about. And uh, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't compare the two very closely at all. Definitely their own characters and um, interesting to read about in their own way for different reasons. So that is about it for this segment of the video. I did want to mention a couple of middle grade books that are centered around Civil War and slavery. I have already talked ab about one of them in my video, and I'll try to put a link of it up here. The Newberry Winners of the 1970s. One of the Newberry Winners was The Slave Dancer by Paula Fox, and I thought it was very compelling, very gritty without being more than what a middle grade reader could take and did not sugarcoat slavery at all. It is about a young boy who is white, who is kidnapped because the um, slavers saw him playing a flute. So they kidnapped him and brought him on board a slave ship so that he could play music so that the slaves would uh, have some music to exercise to and to, to dance. But really, they just made them, they just made them move, and it was horrific. The whole thing was just, just horrific, but the book was so compelling, and um, I, I just, I would highly recommend it. The other book that I think did sugarcoat slavery a little bit is Amos Fortune, Free Man. It's from the 1950s, and uh, I have not yet done that video. I'm still reading some of the other Newberry winners from the 1950s, and I have read that one, and it is, I believe, a autobiographical story. At least it's written in such a way. I don't know whether he was an actual person, a historical figure or not, but it, it does not share the horror stories that other, uh, other fiction of that time frame does. And it is about uh, memories. Uh, like it's, it's a man who's older now. And I think uh, he's a free man now, obviously. Amos Fortune, free man. He's free now, and he is telling his story. There's another story I read recently called Sarni, and it is similar. It is a woman who was born into slavery and has lived past the Civil War, and now she's an older woman, uh, I think in her 80s maybe, and she is recounting her story as a slave girl. It has a uh, another a book that... Previ that was written previous to it called Night John, and it is pretty uh, gritty. It's about a a man who taught, uh, somehow learned his letters and learned to read, and he was responsible for uh, wherever he was. He taught the children, the slave children, he how to read. Like he would write in the sand and teach them their letters, and um, but the story itself is, I think. A little too graphic for very young readers. You know, a YA audience or older middle grade could read it, but it it, it doesn't sugarcoat things. Uh, neither of them do, uh, Night John or Sarni. So anyway, all of those are good middle grade books, some better than others, but they are all about slavery and that time frame. So if you like to read middle grade books and you're not up for one of these bigger chunkers, then you might check out uh, any of those. Of the four middle grade books that I just mentioned, 
my favorite is probably The Slave Dancer by Paula Fox. And so now I'm pretty much done with this part of the video, but I thought while we're on the subject of Civil War literature, in my house, we have quite a bit. Not so much fiction, but we have a lot of nonfiction. My husband and I have been involved in... <laughs> I started saying in an earlier life, uh, same life, just many years earlier, uh, like 20 years ago or yeah, ish, we were, uh, we did attend a few Civil War reenactments and my husband's brother was very involved in Civil War reenactments to the point that he had a, a uniform, a blue and a gray. In fact, he had two blues. So the few times that we joined him and his girlfriend for a Civil War reenactment, um, they both fought on the Union side because, uh, Randy's brother had two union suits so they could both, you know, reenact together. And there was one particular time that we went and um, uh, Randy's brother's girlfriend, I don't want to name names because, you know, they're not in this video. Uh, she had an extra dress. And so I brought, I think, my petticoat from my wedding dress and put under it and then I searched through Emily's closet and we found this little kind of a Victorian looking dress and and a little bonnet and so she was just a toddler she's about 18 months old at the time and if I can find I think uh, I think they're in our scrapbook that uh Thankfully, one of the scrapbooks, it's already done. So uh, I don't know how to insert pictures into a video, but I might just take a little video of my uh, scrapbook so that you can see the picture. I think I was pregnant with Katie at the time. And, uh, and that was just a really fun experience that we had dressing up for the Civil War reenactment. And uh, some of these people take it very seriously. Like, they don't mess around. The clothes they put on are real they're either reproductions down to the letter like you know you're not allowed buttons and things they're they're all very you know you wouldn't have you're not allowed to to have anything that wouldn't have been part of that um you know time frame as far as you know in your costuming and stuff we were just walking around just trying to be part of the atmosphere so um I'm sure some of the stuff I was wearing was not completely appropriate, but I had my own snood and I bought a hat. I, I bought those because at these places, the sutlers are the group of, of sellers that set up tents and sell things. Some are actual vintage items and some are um, reproductions. So you can buy all kinds of things at a Civil War reenactment. And so I don't even know what I ever did with my snood or my hat or anything. And they may still be around here somewhere. Anyway, it was a lot of fun. I will show you that. And then if you're interested, if you want to stick around, I will do just a little bookshelf tour of some of the Civil War literature that we do own. Most of it my husband has read. I have not read much of any of it as far as the nonfiction things. I'm more of a fiction reader. He's more of a nonfiction reader. But if you're interested, um, then that, that'll be on after this. If not, thank you so much for watching. And uh, I hope that you will come back soon for another video. And that's all for this part of the video. So I'll just sign off and say, read a good book and God bless you. And if you're going to stick around, then uh, I hope you enjoy what you see. So here is proof that I am actually am a scrapbooker. It's just been a long time since I've done any. But here's a two-page spread that I did from the Civil War reenactment that I was talking about. It was from the Battle of Horse Landing in uh, near Palatka, Florida. And um, here is a picture of our family. And there's Emily. I kind of think she looks like the old-fashioned Holly Hobby in that dress. And there's her and Randy. So it was a fun day, and um, it was a really cool experience. Okay, the first shelf I want to show you is here in my living room. This is the bottom shelf of the shelving unit that is right near the front door. So, man, were these books dusty. I had not even paid attention to these in a long time. So uh, I dusted them a little bit, but they could still use another good going over. But anyway... Um, these are all Civil War, I believe these are all nonfiction. Um, on, on this shelf, this is more the coffee table type books. There are some others that are smaller that are on another shelf back in the office, but I'll show you these first. Um, this, I think, is like a Time Life set. 
it is a box set of um, illustrated history of the Civil War. So we have arms and equipment of the Confederacy. Illustrated Atlas of the Civil War. And arms and equipment of the Union. And they came in this boxed set. I'm not sure where he got these, but I'm assuming they were a gift from someone. And then here we have Battle History of the Civil War. It's by Philip Catcher. And then I think my sister gave these to Randy. Uh, one is for the North and one is for the South. The series or the set is called Mort Kunstler. I guess it's Kunstlers, maybe. I'm not sure what those little dots signify above the U as to how you pronounce that. But anyway, um, Civil War. And so there's one for the North and one for the South. And those are small little books. So let me move these over. And I went ahead and took these off the shelf so that things didn't fall. Here's a magazine, the Civil War Monitor, 150 Gettysburg. We might have gotten this in Gettysburg when we were there many years ago and toured everything. That was really a, a fun trip. And Shelby Foote. The Civil War, Fort Donelson to Memphis, and Succession to Fort Henry. So these are by Shelby Foote. And then Tenting Tonight, The Soldier's Life. Not sure who that's by. That is a Time Life book. Then we have Heritage of the South by Tim Jacobson. So that is more than just Civil War. That's just the South. Grant and Lee, The Virginia Campaigns, 1864 to 1865 by William A. Frazanito. An Honorable Defeat, The Last Days of the Confederate Government by William C. Davis. William Davis wrote a lot of Civil War books. Well, here's another one. I don't know if they're related. Kenneth C. Davis. Don't know much about the Civil War. Everything you need to know about America's greatest conflict, but never learned. So then we have the Civil War Years, a day to, a day by day chronicle by Robert E. Denny, forward by Gregory J. W. Irwin, and then this is a set, um, Civil War Curiosities by Webb Garrison, and then more Civil War Curiosities by Webb Garrison. This one says, Strange Stories, Oddities, Events, and Coincidences. And then the second one is, Fascinating Tales, Infamous Characters, and Strange Coincidences. So, those look fun. Uh, then we have The Blue and the Gray by, it says, The Consultant, William C. Davis. So, I don't know if this is... Why they would not just say he's the author, unless it's just his history, so he was like the, the editor. I don't know. Anyway, and the last one on this shelf is an illustrated history of the Civil War, Images of an American Tragedy. Okay, now I'm back here in the office. This um, whole bookshelf has mostly my husband's books, and there's just a few more Civil War related books in here. We've got Gettysburg by Stephen W. Sears. Also um, says he's the author of Chancellorsville. And then we have Confederates in the Attic, Dispatches from the Unfinished Civil War by Tony Horwitz. We have Company H or A Sideshow of the Big Show, a classic memoir of the Civil War by Sam Watkins. Edited and with an introduction by M. Tommy, Thomas Ng. And then, I think this is a novel, Escape from Andersonville by Gene Hackman and Daniel Linehan. Um, and I believe that is the Gene Hackman that you, that you know of from movies. And then, this is not a Civil War book. That is, I guess, World War II. Alright, so then, let me put these back. And I will show you a few more over here. We have Eye of the Storm by Private Robert Knox Sneeden or Snedden. Then we have 
The Civil War, State by State, by Chester G. Hearn. And then we have this box set. This is, let me see the name of these. The Civil War by William C. Davis. And it had, let me pause this for a second. Okay, Rebels and Yankees, the fighting men of the Civil War. Rebels and Yankees, the battlefields of the Civil War. And Rebels and Yankees, the Commanders of the Civil War. These are the three books that were in this box set. And then one more I want to show you. This is a copy of the actual book. Um, it's called Reminiscences of the 103rd Illinois Infantry. This is a book that was put together by the men and boys who were in the infantry that my husband's great... Uh, great great grandfather was in and it was uh we made a copy of this book from his copy of the book his name was robert snodgrass i believe everyone in that infant or in that um division what is it 103rd something uh illinois anyway um so he had written his name in the book and then I don't know that his reminiscences are in here, but everyone from the 103rd got a copy of the book. So uh, in doing my genealogy research, we located a family, a different branch of my husband's family, and they had the book and allowed me to make copies of it. So that is pretty cool. I have not read it yet. One of these days I need to. One of these days I need to dust the shelf. <laughs> anyway, um, that is the extent, I believe, of our Civil War, Civil War books. And um, so if you have hung around this long, thank you so much for watching. Uh, pardon my dust. <laughs> pardon our dust. And uh, we will see you again with another video soon. I hope you're having a great day. Read a good book and God bless you.